Hello everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Mipati Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today I'll be doing the last part, that is part four of the deflated current, Roberts chapter 34. So now let us see the third point of point number C, obstacles from the remedial side. Here our first problem is the source of the remedy itself. So the obstacle will be first to find out whether the source of the remedy is correct. Weighing the symptoms of the patient against those of the remedy is one of our major problems. So first and foremost, if only the source is correct, then whatever symptoms we put, we, we are proving it on a healthy human being and whatever symptoms we are getting, then that will be of importance. So that will be of use to us. So weighing the symptoms of the patient against those of the remedy is one of our major problems. Habit and diets of the prover. A word about keynotes as a possible obstacle to cure is not out of place. So let us see one by one these four points. So the first point, our first problem is the source of the remedy itself. How carefully did the homeopathy pharmacist identify the source of his supply? So that is very important. So the homeopathy pharmacist should have identified carefully the source of the supply. So from which source is the supply coming? Is it genuine? Is it reliable? Etc. So that is very important. So if the source is not genuine, it is not reliable, then naturally whatever symptoms are produced when you prove the drug on a healthy human being, it will not be of use or it will be an obstacle. Is the plant identical with the botanical source of the proving? That is also very important. We cannot expect a Rostox case, for instance, to be cured with some other member of the family if we have depending upon the proving of Rostox as a guide. So if Rostox is indicated, no other symptom or other no other remedy would be indicated because we are because we are depending upon the proving for Rostox as our guide. We must be able to depend absolutely upon the source of our remedies. Has there been any carelessness in gathering the original substance or in any part of the process of making the potency or is there any contamination in handling the potency or any dispensing in the recordings of the proving? Then we cannot but expect that the current of cure will be deflected. So this is also very important that upon what is the dependable source of the remedies and has the source of the remedy be gathered correctly or it has been gathered carelessly? And also in the making of the potency, is there, was there any, any contamination while handling the potency or any dispensary in the, in the recordings of the blueprints? That also will act as an obstacle. All these details are known to the homeopathic prescriber. They may spell the difference between life and death and certainly between cure and failure. So, if all these dispensaries occur, then naturally it's a question of life and death of a patient and also between cure and failure of the patient. So if your remedy is correct, if your source is correct, if the preparation is correct without any contamination, then definitely you're on the right track. But if otherwise, then you're on the wrong track, it will be a difference of life and death of cure and failure. We questioned whether the provings were made under proper control. This was very important. Another question is that, that were the provings made under proper control? How many entered into the proving? So what was the number of provers? How accurately was substance, the origin of the potency labeled? That's also, also very important. If you have two, three remedies, you're proving. Suppose the label of one remedy by mistake, it, it goes on to the other, I mean, other substance and you, and you label it in, incorrectly, then naturally, your whole proving would go wrong. So inaccurate labeling might be the difference in possible cure or deflection, which cannot be dealt with successfully to tackle the obstacle. Second, weighing the symptoms of the patient against those of the remedy is one of our major problems. So that means what? Identifying the correct symptoms of the patient and identifying the, its counterpart in our materia medica. That also is a big problem. However, an even more important problem is the weighing of symptoms of the proving itself. But the, one of the greatest problems is what? Is the weighing of symptoms of the proving itself. How much value should be given to symptoms 
which are occasionally or rarely produced in a proving. So question is asked that in a proving, if a symptoms, they only come up occasionally or they are rarely produced, how much value should we give them? For example, the time aggravation, which is almost a keynote of Kali carb, appeared only in one prover. Yes, it has yet it has been clinically confirmed so frequently that you often think that is, it is one of the leading symptoms of Kali carb. So as you all know, Kali carb, the aggravation time is 3 a.m. But that only appeared in one prover. But we have confirmed this clinically or by treating the patients, many patients, and we think it is a leading symptom of Kali Ka. Or when do we think of three, or when we think of three aggravation, we immediately think of Kali Ka. In Ken's repertory is list a number of remedies with this modality. So Kali Ka is not the only remedy. If you see, Robert says, if you see the Ken's repertory, you will find n number of remedies having 3 a.m. aggravation. It is important that we use every means within our power to determine whether or not the occasional symptoms come from the individuality of or of the comes from the individuality of the remedy, or whether it is a deflection of the remedy's dynamics through idiosyncrasies of the patient or through something the patient may do or may use that distorts the reaction. So it is very important that whether to determine whether the symptom uh, whether the symptom which came on did it come out from the exact from the remedy itself or because the patient was idiosyncratic that is why the patient developed some occasional symptoms or patient did something or there was there was some obstacle or there was some problem or there was some problem in the diet or some problem in the regimen or something the patient did which distorts the symptomatology. So that is also another very important obstacle. The habits and diet of Prova. Hanneman gave us very clear directions for making provings. He instructed us that in every case, the usual habits and diet of the prover remain at an ordinary level during the proving. So Dr. Hanneman has always advised us that when a prover is taken for drug proving, his first case history is taken down. His aversions, his desires, et cetera, et cetera, are taken down. This will facilitate us to know whether or not the symptoms are produced by the remedy or by the changes, changes in the prover habits. So this, if you take, if you take, on, take down these symptoms, this will help us to facilitate whether the symptoms are produced by the remedy or they were, it was produced because of some changes in the prover's habits. Even if the patient has become accustomed to the diet, it might deflect the current of symptoms in a like degree to be the disturbing element in the, to the disturbing element in the diet. So, or it may be so that the patient is taking a sort of diet which he is used to, but there may be some disturbing uh, medicinal substance in the diet which may affect the degree of the remedy. In the case Hanneman's provings, he carefully weighed these habits, the habits, diet, and general state of health of each prover. So when Dr. Hanneman used to do the drug proving, he weighed the diet, the habits, and the general state of the health of each prover. This was reflected by the manifestations of symptomatic reaction of each prover before such prover was accepted for the service. This data was subtracted, as it were, from such symptomatology as appeared during the course of proving or within reasonable time thereafter, and the symptoms and the remaining symptoms were credited to the remedy action. That means what? If the patient, as I told you, Dr. Harriman always carefully weighed the habits, diet, and general state of the health of the patient. So if before, before the proving the, of the drug, he has taken down the cravings, the aversion, the sleep pattern of the patient, etc., and whatever distortion was there, that distortion was minused from that, and then the remaining symptoms were put. For example, if the patient had a craving for sweets, and after proving this remedy, also there's a craving for sweets, but this will not be taken by because the patient in a healthy condition also had a craving for sweets, so this symptom will not be taken. But if he has an aversion to sweets, then this will be taken. 
So that is why it says this data was subtracted and the remaining symptoms were credited to the remedy action. Moreover, this procedure was well controlled by the number of provers for each remedy. These details were watched with the precision characteristics of Hanneman. So Dr. Hanneman always used to watch with precision what symptoms the provers or the, the I mean the provers exhibited and every day he used to check the diary of the prover with great precision. So the fourth point, a word about keynotes as a possible obstacle to cure is not out of place. So keynote symptoms have proved themselves as of being almost equal degree of a bane or a blessing. So if you prescribe on keynote symptoms only, it could be a blessing in disguise or, 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 or it could be troublesome also. The average homeopathic physician learns well the polycrest. So Dr. Robert says that an average homeopathic physician, he learns the polycrest very well. He tends to depend upon memorizing a, a more or less brief outline of remedies by only knowing the keynote. So he says that each remedy would be made known to the accurately homeopathic physician by just memorizing a few keynotes of the remedy. If these keynotes are used as a reference to Metra Medica study, they serve well. So if you would just refer these keynotes as a reference to Metra Medica, then it is all right. But it will be very dangerous for prescribing on this basis of keynotes. So, but they are very dangerous for a basis in prescribing. If he prescribes solely on the keynotes, he may and often does remove the clear visible symptoms. So it, it may be so that if you only rely on keynotes, you, you may be blinded and you may not see the other symptoms which are characteristic in the patient. This may serve only as an obstacle to cure by deflecting the current of symptomatology and thus distorting the picture of the patient himself. So if you only rely on keynotes, then your mind will be prejudiced you'll be focused in only finding out the keynotes and the other symptoms which are very pregnant with meaning or which are very characteristic, that will not be seen because the physician's mind is prejudiced. So if he does that, if he only prescribes on keynote, then this will serve as an obstacle and it will deflect the current of the symptomatology and it will distort the picture picture of the patient himself. So naturally, the symptomatology also, which he will not be able to identify, which was characteristic because he was pressurized only with the keynotes. So this will distort the, the picture of the patient. Thus, the physician should distinctly understand the following conditions. So in treating every case, the physician should definitely understand what is treatable and what is not treatable. So what is curable in disease in general and in each individual case in particular. So he must know that in general, what diseases are curable, but naturally it will be more true for each individual case. What is the curative in drugs in general and in each drug in particular? So what are the curative indications of a drug on a very general level? And for each particular drug also will be of importance. He should ensure recovery by adapting what is what is curative in medicine to what is recognized as undoubtedly morbid in the patient. So he should ensure recovery. So recovery should be should be done, or recovery will take place if he the physician adapts what is curative in medicine and he finds the counterpart in Matera Medica. And according to the law of similars, he administers the remedy then the recovery will ensure. The physician should know in each case the obstacles in which the way of recovery and how to remove them. So the physician's job doesn't end only by giving the correct similimum, but he also has to identify what are the obstacles in the case and how to remove them. So by removing these obstacles, the cure will be complete. So if the obstacles are not removed and you give the indicated homeopathic remedy, still the cure will not take place. Then only he will be called the true master of the art of the healing. So when he can identify the obstacles in a given case, then only Robert says that a true homeopathic physician will be called the true master of the art, art of healing. So that's all. So I finished the chapter. 
and I hope I made it very simple for you to understand. And I hope you understood it very well. So please do subscribe to my channel if you if you still haven't. And if you like the video, please do give it a thumbs up. And thank you very much for watching.